Today we have to talk about option valuation. I've decided to put three approaches in one lecture. Under normal circumstances it would probably take two lectures, but today we will be only summarizing some basic concepts. These three concepts are put call parity starting on page 106 in the text, the binomial model starting actually on page 109, most of it the important things that we want to look at 116, and the Black-Scholes model that starts at about 125. Until now, we have never asked ourselves where the price for an option comes from. What are the forces or the mechanics that actually determine the premium for a call or a put at any given time? We will start with a fundamental value relationship that has its own simple elegance. Put-call parity is a value relationship between a put, a call, a stock and a riskless security, a loan or an investment at the risk-free rate. The option must be European type, which means they cannot be exercised early, but only at expiration. In addition, both options refer to the same stock, have the same exercise price and the same expiration date. If these assumptions are met, we can develop a portfolio of these four financial instruments that has very unique features. So let's start with a non-arbitrage table in the way that we already used so often. We will combine a call short, a stock long, buying a put and taking a loan at the risk-free rate. We will put these four financial instruments together and now let's check out what it means as a cash flow at any given time t and what is the payoff if the stock price at expiration is below the exercise price or what is the payoff if the stock price is above the exercise price. Selling a call means a cash inflow for the trader in the amount of whatever the call costs at time t. If the stock price is below the exercise price the call will not be exercised, so no worries. If, on the other hand, the stock price is above the exercise price, then the call will be exercised by the call owner. But the call seller will lose that amount, so his payoff will be ST minus X in parentheses and that as a negative amount. So it's actually a loss. Buying the stock means a cash outflow in the amount of what the stock price is and then at time capital T the stock will be worth whatever it will be worth, either not so much or more, at least more than the exercise price. The put long means buying the put, so that is a cash outflow. And only if the stock price is below the exercise price, the put will be worth something, and that is, as we know, X minus S. And if the stock price is above the exercise price, then the put will not be exercised, its value will be zero. Let's take a short break and let's look what we have with the first three financial instruments. For this scenario, we have plus st minus st is zero and x so that is x we have in this scenario minus st plus st is zero minus minus x is plus x so in both scenarios with these three financial instruments we have in both scenarios a payoff of x 
So let's arrange for a loan so that we will repay x. What is the amount of the loan so that we have to pay x, which includes the amount borrowed and the interest on that amount? This is x discounted with the continuous interest rate of e raised to r to negative r for the amount of time that is left from now to capital T. So if we put that all together, we have here zero in total and here also zero. What does that mean? We have arranged for a portfolio of four financial instruments that for sure have no payoff, no matter what happens. If the stock price goes up or goes down, the value of that portfolio will always be zero. What does it cost to get that portfolio? Answer, it's a cash inflow, a cash outflow, a cash outflow, and a cash inflow. And that all together, that's the cost of that position. But we know that whatever we pay today has no value in the future, then what we pay today cannot have a value now. It must be zero. This is actually the put call parity. It says that we can arrange a portfolio so that those four instruments under the assumptions that we made have no value whatsoever. But that has of course an interesting consequence. The consequence is if we have the fair market prices of three of these securities, we can determine the price of the fourth. Using put call parity, we can determine the price of any one of these securities provided we have fair market prices of the other three securities. When we know the fair price of three of these financial instruments, from that we can determine for sure the fair price of the remaining fourth asset. And simply by rearranging our equation that we just developed, we can duplicate the cash flows or replicate the cash flows or payoffs for each of those positions. So the only thing we have to do is rearrange our equation. Let's see how that works. We have the current stock price, let's that have to be 164 euros. Then we have a call which expires in 103 days and an exercise price of 160. And that call is priced 824. Just for the sake of it, as you can see, this is a call that's already in the money. So then the risk-free rate, let's that's supposed to be 3% per year. A broker offers a put. It doesn't matter if long or short. He offers a put on the stock with an exercise price also of 160 and also the expiration is in 103 days and he offers a put price of 322. So and we are to analyze the situation and to check out if maybe something is wrong with the price of the put or are there maybe arbitrage opportunities. So what we do is we apply put call parity and use the equation that we have, put in all the numbers, the call price that we have, the stock price that we have, then we discount the exercise price with continuous compounding, 3%, don't forget the negative sign, and the time is always a portion of the year. This is 103 days of 365 days. That's around 28% of a, of a year, 0.28. And if we calculate that, we find that the fair price of the put should be 2.891. The offered price of 322 is obviously too high. And then arbitrage means that we will buy whatever is too cheap and we will sell whatever is too expensive. In this case, 
we will sell the put at a price of 322. We will short it, we will sell it. So in this case, what we would do is we short the put, we short the stock, we buy the call and we invest at the risk-free rate. So let's see what happens in this case. This is our data, that's what we know already. This is our arbitrage table and then let's do this. So we buy the call and that gives us a payoff of nothing if the stock is below 160. Uh, you see this right now, the X is 160, so we can actually write 160. The payoff of the call is S minus 160. Then we sell the stock, we short the stock. That gives us 164, that's the price of the stock right now. And then we will have a stock that is whatever the price of the stock will be at time capital T. Then we short the put that gives us the 322. It's marked in red, so we know it's not the market price. It's the price that some broker maybe has offered. And what would be the payoff? If the stock price is low, then of course we will lose. Then we have negative in parenthesis 160 minus S. Or if the stock price is high, then we just keep the 322 and everything is fine. Then we invest at the risk-free rate so that the payoff is exactly 160. How much would we invest at an interest rate of 3% but for the time remaining? That would be if we discount the 160 for the number of days that we are looking at, 103 days, then that would be 158.65. So that gives us no payoff whatsoever in time capital T at expiration. So we are completely off the hook. There's nothing. No inflow, no outflow. So, but what happens in time zero? In time zero, these are our cash flows, inflow and outflow. And that is a net cash inflow of 33 cents. This is the arbitrage profit that we have and this cannot happen. It's not possible. Let's say if the put was priced to 60, then the strategy would be buy this put because it's too cheap. Then we go long in the stock, go short in the call and take a loan at the risk-free rate. So how would that look? Same data as before. The only difference being the put that is priced to 60 have a call short that gives us a cash inflow of 824. No cash in or out if the call expires worthless. But if it is in the money at expiration, then the payoff would be S minus 160. But we have a call short. So that is the amount that we will lose. Then we have a stock. We bought a stock for 164, that's a cash outflow, and then we have a stock, whatever the value of that stock will be. Then we have a put long, which we buy at 260, and it gives us either 160 minus S or it expires worthless. And then again, we take a loan that we have to repay with interest, and that amount, as we know, is 158.65. 160 discounted at 3% for the 103 days that we are looking at. Putting everything together, again, we have zero cash flows and payoffs in time capital T. And then we put all of that together and see what we have. And we have an arbitrage profit of around 29 cents, which is still not possible. Let's look at put call parity from a different angle. For that, I have prepared this table. We can also arrange the equation so that we don't have one financial instrument on one side of the equation and three others to the other side, or all of the four to one side, which means the other side of the equation must be zero. That's how we started. We can also arrange it in the way that we have a put and a call together and a stock and a loan together. So what does that mean? We can put together a call long and a put short. And a call long and a put short would have these cash outflows and inflows. And then we will have these payoffs. 
The call long has a payoff for high stock prices. The put short has a payoff for low stock prices. But the payoff is always the same as S minus X and S minus X. And the only difference is this ST here is lower than this ST here. So these amounts look the same, but they are not. If we have a stock long, we have to buy a stock which we own in time capital T and we take a loan at the risk free rate so that X is the amount that we have to repay. So we have S minus X in both situations. So it doesn't really matter if we have a call long together with a put short or we buy a stock and have a loan at the risk free rate. Both of these must have the same price. And if we rearrange that equation that follows, the call price minus the put price must be the same as the stock price minus the discounted exercise price at any given time. Before expiration, this must hold. In the text, I have prepared some more applications for the put call parity and an operation if there is room for arbitrage, which it is, otherwise it wouldn't make much sense to practice it when we have to determine the price for the call in this case. And then we will arrange for arbitrage transactions because the call is mispriced and we can make an arbitrage profit which of course in reality will probably not happen. But uh, since we have to learn why put call parity has to hold and actually does hold in real life, we have to see what happens if the prices were not in line with put call parity. And that cannot happen because then there are so many traders out there in the world checking out prices and checking out if they can have a quick profit by buying and selling those financial instruments, the chances that this will happen are really low. The next valuation concept that I will shortly sketch is the binomial model. All those option pricing models rely on some assumption about the price movement of the underlying. In the binomial model, it is implied that from one moment to the next, the stock price can only have either an uptick or a downtick. And the extent of an uptick or a downtick is constant over time. Let's look at the example in the text and we start with the example on page 117. The stock price is 52 right now. We assume that each time the stock can go up by 12% or down by 8%. And we look at a model that only comprises, and we look once again, and we look at a model that only goes over two periods, which is we have three points in time. So the stock can go up, can go down, and can go up again and it can go down again and always by the same proportion. So in this case, it is assumed it goes up with 12%, which is the up factor, and it goes down with 8%, so the down factor would be 0 0.92. In a simplified world of two periods only, we can model the price movement of the underlying like this. Now we have to look at the call. Let the call have an, in, an exercise price of 50. We can already determine what the value of the call at expiration will be. It will be S minus X, which is 65.23 minus 50 or 53.58 minus 50 or 44.01 minus 50. And that means the option will not be exercised. The value of the option is zero.
for each step we can now show that it is possible to combine a certain quantity of a stock long and a certain quantity of a loan such that these two financial instruments replicate the value of a call in all states of the world. Let's get a quick idea about how the binomial model works. It works by going backwards from time 2 to time 0 and in steps from time 2 to time 1 and then from time 1 to time 0. And our final goal is to determine the call values at any given point in time. We know already what the call values will be at expiration. At time 2 we have already identified that under the assumption of a stock price movement in the given way, then the stock will in the up-up scenario 65.23 in which case the call will be 1523. And if the stock goes down, then the stock price will be 53.58 and the call will be 358. So then we put that into a table. The stock, either long or short, and a loan or an investment, which is a bond, long or short, the interest rate is 4%. We ask ourselves, can we possibly find a number of stocks, which is x1, and the number of bonds, which is x2, a bond of 1 euro each, so that we combine those two financial instruments that we get exactly the value of the call for both scenarios. So do we find an x1 and an x2 that satisfies two conditions at the same time? And we can do that. We find it. The x1 would actually be 1 and the x2 would be 48 and change. And that means we would have to buy one stock and take a loan of 48.08. And all of that we should be doing in time 1 in the up scenario. And if we do that, we can ask ourselves if we know the value of the stock is 58.24 and we buy one, part of that being financed with a loan of 48, then the net cash outflow is 10 euros and change. And then if we look at that, what is the outcome of this? We have arranged that we have a portfolio in time 2 that either has a value of 1523 or 358, which is the same value as the call. Therefore, we can conclude if we can arrange a portfolio of stock and bond, or stock and a loan, so that it has the same payoff than a call, then the amount invested must be the same for the portfolio and for the call. So in this situation, the call in time one in the up scenario must be 10 euros 0.163. Then we go to the next partial problem. We have now identified what the call must be worth in time one in the up scenario. Now we have to check out what should the call be worth in the down scenario in time one. And we do the same calculation. Now we have to check out in the down scenario the stock is worth 47.84. It may go up to 53.58. At the same time the call option would be worth 3.58. It's expiration. Or the stock is 44.01 in which case the call is worth nothing. Again, now let's figure out if we can arrange for a portfolio of stock and a loan so that we have the same outflow, the same payoff as the call would provide in those two scenarios. Again, we make an equation system and find that 
the number of stocks that we would have to buy in time one down and the loan that we would have to arrange for the number of stocks is 0.37 and so on and the loan is 15 euros 838 and then we can check this to see if this holds if we buy 0.37 stocks that cost 47.8 for each that means we have to pay 1790 at the same time we take a loan in the amount of 15838 which means it's a net cash outflow of 2 euros 7 that's the value of the position that must also be the value of the call because with this portfolio we can arrange that we will have in time to a stock or 0.37425 pieces of a stock in total that is worth 20 and we have to repay the loan with interest of 1647 so that we have left over 358 if the stock is below 50 and it will be 44.01 we have a value of 16.47 in stock and we have to repay 1647 in the loan so that leaves us with nothing and that means the portfolio of the stock and the loan yields the same state contingent claim the same dependent payoff as the call which means the call in time one down must have a value of two euros and seven. Now we can do the third step and can take the values from time one and determine the call value in time zero with the same logic. So now we know we have already determined the prices for the call in time one up and time one down. And now we do this for time zero. We put together a portfolio that creates the same payoff as the option. And we do this by trying to figure out a portfolio in time zero so that we buy a certain amount of stock which are priced 52 and probably take a loan so that we have to repay the loan with 4% interest and we have a certain number of stocks in time one either in the up scenario or the down scenario and they have to have a value of 10 16 or 207 so we do the same trick with the equation system and find out that the number of stocks that we need is 0.77 and a little bit more and the loan we have to take is 33.82 and a little bit more and that is what we have to do the investment would then be in the stock 40 something 40 point something and the loan reduces the net cash outflow so the total investment would be 6.66 and then if we check for the real value of the portfolio we will find it has in total the same payoff as the option in both scenarios if the stock goes up of course there is a higher value in the stock and still the 35 is the amount to be repaid with interest and the difference is 10.163 if the stock goes down we still have the same proportion of the stock but it's only worth in total 37.25 the repayment is still 35 that's always the same repayment of course and the total value is 2.07 which must be or which is the same value as the call if we put that all together we now have determined by going backwards by going by solving one partial problem the second partial problem and the third partial problem we have determined portfolios and that's the important thing here we have shown that it is possible to combine a certain quantity of a stock and a certain quantity of a loan such that these two financial instruments replicate the value of a call in all states of the world that is actually the main element in the binomial model 
And there's one thing that we can now see. All the data that we have developed through the calculations, we can now go forward from time 0 to time 1 up, which is here, time 1 down, which is this part, and then from time 1 up, we go second time up, then we land here, or we go down, we land here, or from time 1 down, we go up, then we will be here, or we go down a second time, and we will be here. So we have already determined that we have to buy 0.77858 stocks and take a loan of 33.82 euros and that would result in a net investment of 6.66 and that is also the value of the call. If the stock price goes up, then the call will also increase to 10.163. If the stock price goes down, the call price will be 2.07, but that is the same value in both scenarios as the value of the portfolio of the stock and the loan that has to be repaid. The model implies that there is a redeployment of capital at time one up or down, which means the amount that has been created by the investment in time zero or the amount of 207 is then changed into a new combination, but with the same value. The position will be sold and then it will be bought again with different proportions of stock and the loan, but the total value is the same. There is no change in the total value of the position. And the same goes for the situation in time one if the first movement was down. No change in the total value of the position, but the amount of stock and the amount of the loan is changed. And with that combination, it goes either up or goes down for both scenarios. And we can see that we will, with the combination of stock and loan, have the same value as the call will have at expiration. Let us summarize the elements that go in such a model. First, it is the stock price at time zero, because without it we cannot develop the binomial tree, which shows the price development over time. The value of the option is not determined by the expected price of the asset, but by its current price, which of course reflects expectations about the future. Then, second, we need the up and down factors, which indicate the assumed volatility of the stock. The ups and down factors are actually model assumptions about how far the stock can go up or down over time. This is what we call the volatility of the stock. Then three, we need time. Here we have a very simple model. We only have three points in time which indicate two periods. Then we have the interest rate that plays a role because the interest rate is needed to determine the replication with the loan. And finally, there is the exercise price. Without it, we cannot start calculating the terminal value of the call at expiration. These are the five parameters that influence the price of an option. Keep that in mind when we look at more complicated and more advanced formula. And again, the core of the valuation model is the duplication idea that the value of a call at any given time can be replicated by the amount of stocks long combined with a certain amount of a loan. This model is what we call a discrete time model. What does that mean? In mathematical dynamics, it says here in Wiki, discrete time and continuous time are two alternative frameworks within which to model variables that evolve over time. Discrete time means there are steps in time, points in time. And continuous times means there are no steps. It is like a smooth development over time and there are actually, well, there's the period length is actually close to zero. 
So the model is a discrete time model and that means that from one moment in time to the next it is like a real step. And only at these points in time in our very simplified model it's only one point in time that is possible. The portfolio can be hypothetically reshuffled which means the portfolio is sold and immediately repurchased again but with different proportions of stock and loan. But the total value stays the same in this very moment. This is what is called a self-financing strategy. Of course a binomial model with two periods does not provide yet an intuitive feeling of reality. But we can develop the model and make time periods shorter and assume more time periods. We will observe that the shorter the time periods, the smaller the price changes of the underlying assets. That makes a lot of sense. The smaller the time periods between points in time, the less the value of the stock can go up or down. This will lead to price changes becoming infinitesimally small as time periods approach zero. So when the time periods become so small that they are practically zero, then we have a continuous price process. When the price process is continuous, which means price changes become smaller as time periods get shorter, the binomial model for pricing options converges on the Black-Scholes model, which was actually developed by three outstanding researchers, three outstanding professors in this field, uh, Professor Black, Professor Scholes and Professor Merton. So we are not going to look at how the model is derived. The important aspect is still that it is based on the idea of creating a portfolio of the underlying asset and the riskless asset with the same cash flows and therefore the same cost as the option being valued. Black, Scholes and Merton didn't try to answer the question how much will the stock price rise or fall. Instead, they made an important assumption that a stock price rises and fall in the same predictably unpredictable manner as dust moved by atoms and molecules in the air. They follow a normal distribution, which means that small movements are much more likely than extreme movements. Mathematically speaking, the assumption is that the stock price follows a geometric Brownian motion, which is the random motion of particles suspended in a fluid, a liquid or a gas. So what they actually did was they said the stock price could develop, could up and down, could expand a little bit similar like gas in the air. That was actually something really big to think about physics and to say hmm, maybe we don't know exactly how the stock price goes up and down, but the randomness somehow is maybe similar to a gas diffusion process in the air. With this assumption, the only variable needed to understand the normal distribution, the probability that a stock's price will change by such and such an amount, is the stock's volatility, which we denote as sigma the standard deviation of stock prices or stock returns. So let's look at the formula itself. So the first thing we have is the price of the call is equal to something with S minus something with X. And that is something that we know already. This is nothing else but the intrinsic value of a call at, well, at expiration for sure. And we already said, well, in a way, it's the intrinsic value at any given time if we look at this like practitioners, because then we don't make complex time value calculations. But the formula is a little different. The formula then goes on and says, we multiply the S with something with a factor 
and we will discount the x with the risk-free rate for the time that we have until expiration though so in this formula just like before the t resembles the time that is going to pass until expiration and it's measured as a proportion of a year and then we multiply this with another factor which is n of d2 so we have two factors n of d1 and n of d2 that we have to multiply so what is n of d1 and n of d2 they are both probabilities they are the cumulative probability distribution function for a standardized normal random variable d obviously the d1 value and d2 value are unpleasant looking formulas if this is a probability n of d1 then it is something between 0 and 1 and so is n of d2 something between 0 and 1 obviously s times some probability is the value of what we will receive if we exercise the option later so it's the present value the s is automatically a present value because it's the value of the stock right now and multiplied with some probability and then we have the exercise price but that is discounted in a way the discounting reflects the idea in order to exercise the option of course x is necessary but x is only necessary at the time of expiration which amount would be necessary to keep right now and that amount would be less than x so x needs to be discounted continuous interest rate by e raised to negative rt and that is a little less than x itself but that also is multiplied with this factor which is between 0 and 1 and then we can have a quick look at the d1 and d2 the mathematical concept behind it is not trivial so but let's look at the variables and let's see if we find something that we can use to get a more intuitive understanding s divided by x the higher the difference between s and x meaning if s is high then the probability that the option will be worth something is also high so if x x is a constant so s is maybe going up hopefully so if that difference is high then this value also becomes higher if the interest rate is high then the total value of this will also be higher then sigma is in both is in the numerator and the denominator but sigma is squared in the numerator and that sigma squared is as we know the variance here it's only sigma it's the standard deviation so the higher the sigma the higher the value d1 here the higher the sigma the lower the value because here is the negative the minus and then we have t which is the remaining time that is not so much of, an, uh, of a consequence to d1 as we can see in real calculations but the most important thing is probably the volatility and of course the difference between s and x if hopefully s is above x and maybe even a lot above x let's do a quick calculation with the formula Netflix stock price at April 17 that's just about now was around 423 the risk-free rate is about 0.65 percent we are to determine the theoretical price of a call on Netflix stocks for a strike price of 425 and a sigma of 90 percent and the call expires in seven days so let's first check out for the risk-free rate from april 17 and that would be 
0.65%. Then we have some volatility information. So, but they are very, very different because the volatility is the standard deviation. And the standard deviation is a calculation uh, from historical from past data and that can be done in very different ways and then we have maybe even very different calculations depending on how many days are we looking at uh, do we which prices of the stock do we actually take do we take closing prices or do we take lows and highs for our example i simply took 90 percent which is pretty high uh, but as you will see, this is April 17. We are in the middle of stock prices going up and down, mostly due to the situation uh, actually in the world with Corona and all. So the Zigmas are actually quite high. Um, Netflix hasn't paid some dividends, so we don't have to worry about dividend payments and things like that. And definitely not in seven days. So then we put, we plug in all the numbers that we have, which is of course some calculation, and we find the D1 values and the D2 values. And then we take the cumulative probability distribution for the standardized normal random variable. We can do this with Excel, would make it much quicker. In the text it's described uh, how that works. In the text on page 129, we can see how this is done with Excel. So, and then we can determine, and you can see that with the D1 and two D2 values, we can use Excel to determine the probabilities. Going back to our example, uh, we have the probability N of D1 is 0.51 and a little bit more and n of d2 is 0.46 and a little bit more and we plug it in the formula that we already have 423 is the price of the stock right now times the probability n of d1 minus 425 discounted for seven days or 365 days at an interest rate of 0 0.0065 which is 0.65 percent and that then multiplied with the second probability and then we get a call price of 20.11 so let's uh, look at this table here i have prepared uh, in Excel a table that shows us call prices and put prices with certain days to expiration, 7, 60 days, 170 days. Same for the puts, but we disregard the puts for a moment. We only look at the calls, which is this here. And then with the data from the Netflix example, here is the input that we use. The stock price right now is 423. The Sigma, let's start with 90%. I'll explain that in a second why. And the risk-free rate of 0.65%. Then I checked out the internet for some prices that are being made by market makers or dealers. And these were the prices that I looked up in the internet. And they were based on the calculation using a sigma, a standard deviation of 110%. And when they are based and when they are calculated with a sigma of around 110, then these are the prices that the Black Scholes formula gives. And as you can see, the differences are very, very low. What does this tell us? It tells us that even if in other databases the volatility was being assumed with something around 60 percent but then the prices would have been only and should have been only these here and then the difference between the prices that the market makers gave and the prices that are theoretical from the black scholes formula are very different 
So the market makers obviously assume that the volatility for seven days calls is very, very high. It's about 110%. But that is not the same volatility that they assume for 60 days expiration. For 60 days expiration, they did not assume 110% because with 110% and 60 days, the formula would say this is the fair price. 76, 74, 71, 68. But the market prices were this. These are the prices given right now in the internet, which give and take a little because these prices also fluctuate to some degree. But that was from the 17th of April. So which means the market obviously priced with a different volatility, which is around 55%. So if we take 55% as a volatility, then the Black-Scholes formula gives us these prices, which are much closer to the prices right now in the market. The difference is also neglectable. What we can see here if we treat the price of an option as a given quantity, like this here, the market prices, and then we try to figure out which volatility did they use, did the market use to come to these prices, if we use the volatility to put into the Black-Scholes formula, then we call this volatility the implied volatility of the option. We can use the Black-Scholes formula to show us how the market estimates the volatility of a stock. If I know the market price of the option, I can approximate the volatility that the market maker assumes to be the foundation of his pricing. And that volatility is then called implied volatility. This is actually the only information that traders can disagree over or will disagree over and they may trade against the opinion of a counterparty. It may be well the case that one trader thinks well 55% is not the volatility that I see in the prices. This is overpriced or underpriced and then he can trade against that or the 110 for the seven days option. Maybe the, maybe the, uh, the trader thinks, one trader thinks that is, that is a lot too, that's too much. It should be much less, it should be 60. So the real price of the option of a 420 option should be 15.55. Maybe he can short that position and trade against the pricing of the dealer. Possible, maybe, advisable, what do I know? In real life, often market makers will not give prices of the options, but they will rather convey listings of the volatilities that they currently use and assume. And why do they do that? Well, because all the other data is not debatable. The stock price right now is known. So is the risk-free rate, more or less. There's not much difference and even worse, the differences in possible risk-free rates is so minimal that we hardly even find it as a result in the option prices. So that's not a big thing. The strike price is a constant. So for all the strike prices, we know they won't change. And the expiration date is given. The only variable that not only may be, but will be controversial is the expected volatility of the asset price. And it is the expected volatility. The historical volatility is only the volatility that comes from past stock prices. And the prices for the options are being made up of the volatility that the market will expect or is expecting for the next future, for the next seven days, for the next 60 days. So we are not even talking about the same volatility. So then let's have a look at the N of D1 and N of D2 probabilities. They are, as I said, both probabilities. The N of D1 is also the delta of the option. It is the number of stocks to buy 
in the portfolio that replicates the call. Just like the binomial model, the Black-Scholes formula also assumes that hypothetically there is a portfolio between the stock and a loan to replicate the payoff of the call. That is what the S minus X is about. The call price is being made up of the S to some degree, the delta. It is the number of stocks to buy in that portfolio together with the discounted x multiplied with the probability n of d2, which by the way is the probability that the call will be exercised. The n of d2 is a real probability. This delta is very, very important. This delta is a number between 0 and 1. Mostly it is a lot below 1 and it is usually more than 0. The delta is also the expected dollar change in the call price for a one dollar change in the stock price. Let's go back to the data that we had. We had N of D2. With this data, 423 is the stock price right now. And with a sigma of 90% and an X of 425, the option is not yet in the money. The probability that the option will be in the money so that it will be exercised is not that high is 46 percent that's not bad but it's also not exciting then we have the n of d1 which is the delta and that is around 51 percent what does that mean right now if the stock goes up by one dollar from 423 to 424, the option is expected to go up by around 51 cents. This is what the delta says. The delta is the amount by which the option will increase, in this case increase, if the stock increases by one dollar. And of course, the delta will change. If there is a different stock price, maybe it's only six days then, then the delta will also change. From the Black-Scholes formula, we can also derive a number of variables, parameters, that are called in practical life Greeks, Greek letters. The delta, gamma, theta, vega, rho, omega, and for those who speak Greek, a vega is not a Greek letter, it is just, well, for whichever reason, the literature or the practitioners have developed these names. So the delta is something that we already know. The delta is the N of D1. And as I said, it is for the call option. It's between zero and plus one. And for a put option, it is between zero and negative one. And we can say it's about the amount that the amount that the call price will change for one dollar change in the underlying price and the delta will change if the stock price increases then the delta increases the question is how much does it increase if the stock price increases so for that we have the gamma the gamma measures the sensitivity of the delta to changes in the price of the underlying. So it's actually the second derivation of the option price function. By the way, the delta is the first derivation of the option price function. But we can leave it at that. The mathematical background is uh, not so important right now. Nobody derives these things themselves. So don't worry about that. So the gamma is the is the way that the delta will change when the underlying price changes. The theta measures the sensitivity of the option with regard to the time that goes by. And here we have some, well, some ways to keep in mind what it is. Theta starts with a T, it refers to the time. Vega starts with a V, it refers to the volatility. Rho starts with an R and it is the interest rate. So we have the theta measures the sensitivity of the option price to time. That is interesting because the further the option approaches expiration, the more time value is lost. 
So that goes really, really quick. So the theta might be important. Then, of course, the vega is very important. The volatility is really important, as we have seen by doing some small calculations. Then the rho, not so important, because the interest rate also has an influence on the option price, but the influence is not so significant. From this we can see what are the factors determining the price of an option. The exercise price, that is clear. The higher the exercise price, the lower is the price of the call. And for the put, it's the other way around. The expiration date. The longer time there is, usually we should expect that the call and the put, they have more chances to become more valuable. So that would be in most cases true. For puts it's not always true, but, but for calls it's true. The longer the call is going until expiration, the higher the value at any given time. Or if we compare two options, everything the same except expiration date. We should observe that the option with the longer expiration date is worth more. Then the stock price right now is of course a variable and everything else equal. The higher the stock price, the more valuable the call. And on the other hand, the lower the stock price, the more valuable the put. The risk-free rate, also very simple. The higher the risk-free rate, the more valuable the call. And for the put, it's the other way around. The higher the risk-free rate, the lower the put value will be. But the influence of the risk-free rate is not that significant. The most important variable in this, the volatility. The volatility of the underlying, the variance or the standard deviation, that is of course very, very important and by far the most influential variable in the value of the option. So that means actually that there is it's absolutely possible that, for example, let's say you have a call. The stock price goes in the right direction. It goes up, but it goes up in small steps, but it's going up. It's going in the right direction. But when the volatility drops, then it may well be that you may observe your call should go higher, but it is not going higher because at the same time the volatility drops. So these effects can actually go against each other. So I already said something about the implied volatility and the historical volatility. That is that if we use the Black-Scholes-Merton model, then we may use historical volatility. But in the end of the day, the price of an option also is determined by supply and demand. And that may mean that expected volatility that goes into the pricing of the option is different from what we see historically. And that is the difference between implied volatility that is in the stock, in the call price or in the option price, implied volatility that is implied in the option price and historical volatility that we can put into our formula ourselves and then see what the value of the option should be if the option price follows the Black-Scholes formula. So we are already at the end of this session. Any questions can be sent to me via email to my known email address or write your questions in the comments below. Once I see them, I'll answer them for everyone to see and profit from it. So for now, take care and peace out.